Hello, my name is Tanya Hergenrader. I am the Career Pathways and Advising Director here at WNCC. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator which is a, an assessment that you all should have taken or had the opportunity to take that um, essentially uh, measures your personality preferences. So, and then you can use that information to sort of inform um, your interactions with other people, how you communicate, your leadership style, um, career choices and career pathways, um, and all kinds of other things. So today we are gonna focus mostly on how your personality style and personality preferences may impact communication and leadership. So um, we're going to kind of go through um, what the MBTI means and validate and verify your personality type. And then once we've done that, we'll talk about how that plays into communication style and leadership. So we will go ahead and get started. First, I'd like you to just meet our team. Um, if you don't know, we are located on the Scotts Bluff campus. We're located just in the, in the new Welcome Center in the Student Success Center. So it's right by the Welcome Desk as you come into the Welcome Center. Um, we also have office hours on the Sydney and Alliance campuses. And then we are also available virtually all the time um, as well via Zoom or phone. Um, or if it's a simple thing, um, also via email. So please um, take a screenshot if you want to, or just take note of our contact information here. Um, we have different staff who handle different things, but you can contact any one of us at any time and we'll get you with the right person. Um, and then <clears throat> that's a good segue into our services. So we have um, quite a few services we offer. We do academic advising for your first semester here on campus. So many of you may know us from that. Um, and what that entails is just sort of getting you onboarded, um, making sure that you have the information you need to um, make an informed decision about your career path, and then helping you get registered for classes for your first semester. Um, after your first semester, um, you are assigned a faculty advisor who specializes in your program of study, and that is the person that you work with for the duration of your time here at WNCC until you graduate. Um, we also do transfer advising, which is um, really just helping you if you're planning on transferring to a four-year institution after WNCC. It's really just helping you with the nuts and bolts of that transfer process so we can help you decide where you want to transfer and help you explore options. We can help you apply for transfer scholarships. And then when it comes time to actually transfer your credits, we can help you with that, that process as well. Um, we also coordinate internships out of this office. So many programs will allow you the opportunity to do internships for credit and business is no exception. So if that's something you're interested in doing, um, you would work with our office to find an internship and get all the paperwork completed for that internship experience. Um, an internship is just really a work-based learning opportunity for you to work on site in a field that you are interested in and get academic credit for that work. Um, we also offer career services. So what that does, um, what we do there is we help you, essentially, you prepare for the world of work. So we help you develop the skills necessary to be successful in the workplace. Some of those soft skills like communication skills, time management, those kinds of things. We also help you develop a really, really competitive resume, put together a cover letter. We help you with the job search process. We offer career fairs um, and we help connect you with employers um, so that you can find a good job. We also do career exploration, which is really helping you um, to decide what career path might be the best fit for you. So if your major is, let's say, business administration, but you're not exactly sure what you want to do with that major, um, we can help you uh, explore options to, so that you know what the opportunities are in that field. Um, also, if you just aren't sure that you're in the right major, you can meet with us and we can help you look for other options that may be a better fit for you and then determine how many of your credits will transfer over from your old major and how long it will take you to graduate. So those are all things we can do there. I mentioned the job fairs. We also do transfer fairs um, where we have 
college reps from four-year institutions around the region come to campus and provide information to students about transfer scholarships, their programs of study, and just different opportunities um, there if you were to transfer um, with them. And then we offer a variety of workshops just like the one I'm doing right now. So if you ever have a request for a workshop or just want someone to give a presentation on something career related or advising related, you can reach out to me or anyone in our office and we could put something together for you. So that's kind of a little bit about us. Let's jump into the Myers-Briggs type indicator. So you guys may have all heard the terms extrovert and introvert. Um, and th this inventory is where those terms actually come from. So it's been around a really long time. Um, it's been through lots of trials, um, research trials, and um, has been peer reviewed and um, it's reliable and valid and um, it's pretty, it's a pretty good measure of your core preferences. Um, it's not necessarily uh, meant to box you into anything. It's just meant as a way to help you articulate maybe some, what some of your personality preferences are. That's all it's meant to do. Um, so, and, and just because you score one type doesn't mean that that's the type that you're going to express all the time. Um, and I'll give you examples of that kind of as we go through. So you have to self-validate your type, meaning that as we kind of go through um, the different constructs of the personality type, you're the one that has to determine what fits best for you. Um, no one else can assign the type to you. I'm sure that, you know, you've seen other people put labels on others or on you before. And this is not meant to be an opportunity for other people to label you. It's really for you to identify what fits best for you. Um, also, using your non-preferred type is difficult but not impossible. Um, it's almost like wearing your shoes on the wrong feet is how I say it. So if you're a natural extrovert and then you're placed in a situation where you do not have any interaction with people, which if you know anything about extroverts, they like being around people. Um, it, it's not that they can't do that, it's just that their preference is not that. So it's gonna feel like they're wearing their shoes on the wrong feet. It's gonna feel uncomfortable to them, but they can still do it. Um, so, and then developing your non-preferred characteristics can also be a reflection of growth. So that's something to keep in mind as well as we move forward. So we're gonna jump into the differences between the types. So there's four different personality constructs that are measured with the MBTI. And so we're gonna go through all four of those. Each one is on a spectrum. And so there's one type at one end of the spectrum and another preference at the other end of the spectrum. And you're gonna fall somewhere in between. Um, so this, um, this is just an overview of that. So the first construct that is measured is extroversion versus introversion, which is simply how you uh, focus your attention and energy, particularly in regards to social interaction. Sensing versus intuition is how you acquire or take in information. Thinking versus feeling is how you go about making decisions. And judgment versus perceiving is how you relate to the outer world and also how you go about structuring your time. Um, so we're going to jump into what is what do these things mean? And I want you um, to go ahead at this point and take out a piece of paper and something to write with so that you are able to record what your preferred type is. Okay, that's gonna be really important as we move forward. So extroversion versus introversion. Um, extroverts are very much um, outward focused. So they get their energy from being around other people. They derive their energy from social interactions, from interpersonal interactions. Um, they tend to speak before they think, so they're verbal processors, um, and they are very much um, enjoy learning by doing, so jumping into something and kind of learning as they go, that's their preference. Um, they tend to be more talkative. Um, they tend to be the ones who are speaking out in class more often. Um, 
So that's um, an extrovert. An introvert, they derive their energy from within. So they tend to feel drained by social interactions, particularly if it's with people they're not familiar with or people they don't know. Um, it's not that they can't have social interactions or that they don't want to. It's that they need time to recharge after a day of interacting with people. They tend to think before they speak. So they like to be thoughtful and deliberative. Um, so they're not the first person speaking out in class simply because they really like to give some thought to what they're going to say before they say it, um, which can be a really, that can really be a strength. Um, they tend to keep really, really close friends. So they tend to have more of um, a tight knit group of close friends and they value those relationships very much versus having loose sorts of um, interactions with lots of different people um, and not having as, as meaningful connections with people. So that's kind of the difference between extroversion and introversion. What I want you to do now is I want you to write down which one you think you are. So if you think you're an extrovert, write down an E. Um, and if you think you're an introvert, write down an I. All right, and we're going to jump to the next one. The next construct is sensing versus intuition, which is all about how you take in information. So sensors just tend to be very uh, tactile in their, the way they take in information. They like to, um, I always give the example of if a sensor were sitting in a coffee shop doing their homework and it's a busy coffee shop, they're going to notice who's coming in the door. They're going to notice, uh, they're going to hear people's conversations. They're going to notice um, people's orders as they're standing at the counter placing their orders. They're going to feel the breeze every time the door opens and cold air gushes in to the room. They're going to, all of those things um, are going to, they're, they're, going to get, they're going to have an awareness of those. So if somebody were to come in and rob the coffee shop, the sensor is the one you would want to interview because the sensor is going to have noticed more details about what was going on around them than the intuitor. So that's one way to kind of set yourself apart. Sensors are also very practical. So they like um, step by step by step instructions when they're completing a task. Um, they like checklists, they like instructions, they like everything to be very clear. They also tend to be very a uh, lot more detail oriented than an intuiter, okay? So then on the other hand, there's the intuiter. And the intuiter is a lot more kind of big picture type person. So they're really good at brainstorming big ideas. They're good at seeing how different ideas relate to one another. They're, they have great imaginations. Um, they are very much go with their gut types of people when it comes to getting things done. Um, they're not good with details. They're not good with um, step by step by step, and they're definitely not the person you'd want to interview if somebody were to rob the coffee shop, because they very likely would have been sort of able to escape into their own head and not pay attention to everything going on around them as much, which is which can be very much be a strength as well. Um, so I want you to think about now which one you think fits you best. Is it a sensor, the detail-oriented person who notices everything around them, or is it the intuitor who is the more big picture, imagination, um, dreamer type person? So go ahead and write that down. And then next, we're going to talk about thinking versus feeling. So thinkers, remember, this is all about how you make decisions. So thinkers are very, very logical in their decision making. So they like to um, look at the facts and are not necessarily as concerned with how people feel or people's opinions on the matter. So one really great example I always like to give is if a thinker were to purchase a vehicle, a new car, they would be looking at consumer reports and they would be looking at sort of the black and white 
um, details of what they need in a vehicle, um, whatever that is, they would be um, more concerned with um, gas mileage and very practical analytical type things like that. A feeler, on the other hand, does value other people's opinions and they're concerned with how their decision is going to impact people. Um, so they really do look at um, the impact their decision is going to make on the team or on the people around them. So with the same example of purchasing a car, a feeler is going to be concerned with like, for example, if, if their dad is a Ford guy, then they're going to be taking that into consideration because, um, you know, they may not want to buy a Chevy if their dad's a Ford guy, or they also might be a little more swayed by the salesman, particularly if the salesman has a picture of his family on his desk and they're concerned of him not making the sale is going to impact his family. Um, and things like that. So um, both thinkers and feelers can make great leaders. They both can make very, very good decisions. Um, but it's just important to distinguish that the feelers are just more concerned with people and thinkers are more analytical. Another way to distinguish the two is feelers don't like to step on people's toes. So they tend to avoid conflict um, or they tend to really try to harmonize a situation. So if there's people arguing, the feeler sometimes is the person who steps in and tries to smooth everything over. The thinkers don't mind conflict and that doesn't bother them. They also, they're not going to lose a lot of sleep by stepping on people's toes. And what I mean by that is making a, a decision that other people are not happy with. Um, so go ahead and write down which one you think you are, um, thinker or feeler. Okay, the next one and the last one is judging versus perceiving. And this is just about how you sort of structure your time and deal with the outer world. So judgers are very, very structured people. They just tend to thrive on routine and structure. Um, they like to be very organized. They like to know what's coming. So they're the type of people who would like to plan out a vacation well in advance and have a very clear idea of what they're going to be doing where they're going to be going, all of that stuff on the vacation. Um, they thrive off of like goal setting. So setting goals and tracking their progress toward those goals is really, really important to a judger. Um, perceivers are much more sort of go with the flow, spontaneous, very adaptable, very flexible. They don't need a structure and a schedule as much as a judger does. Now in you know our society, we all have to ha keep a schedule, right? For school, for jobs, for all that kind of stuff. But remember, this is your core preference. So the core preference of a perceiver is to be completely spontaneous. Um, and so a perceiver with the vacation planning thing would be much more likely to plan a last minute vacation, just fly down to Mexico or wherever you're going to go and don't and just take one day at a time. Don't plan anything out and just sort of let um, let things unfold as they will. So um, you can see benefits to both for sure. Um, another kind of way to identify which one you are is a perceivers tend to be more procrastinators. So they tend to put things off more where judges um, like to get things done ahead of time. So um, go ahead and write down which one you think you are, judger or perceiver. Um, and now what you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with a four letter type. Okay. So it, um, extroversion versus introversion. I told you um, you would be either an E or an I there. I'm an extrovert. So I would be an E. Um, the uh, sensor versus intuiter would be an S or an N. Um, for intuiter, we have N, not I, because we used I for introvert. So I um, happen to be an intuiter, so I would be an N. Um, the next one, feeler versus thinker, is an F or a T. I'm a feeler, so I would be an F on that one. And then the last one, judging versus perceiving, is a J or a P. I'm a judger. So my personality type is an ENFJ. Okay, that makes sense. That's really important because if you 
plug that four letter type into Google, it's going to pull up just a treasure trove of information about that personality type, all kinds of fun things. So it's helpful to know what that four letter type is. So definitely write that down and keep track of that. Okay, so considerations when looking at your results. Um, I really like this quote. Um, the discipline comes in when we have to pay attention to what we don't like, aren't interested in, don't understand, and mistrust. So there's this thing called the shadow self. And that is um, where our personality preference has maybe a little bit of a dark side, right? So um, Sometimes it can be really annoying if we encounter someone with the off opposite personality preference to us and we don't understand where they're coming from. Um, also, sometimes uh, our, our own personality types can get in our own way. So I always like to use myself as an example because I just think it's the best example to use since I know myself. But I know for me, I can become a little too much with my extroversion. I have to be careful, especially when I'm around introverts, on how much I put out and ha how much information I speak and just throw out there um, because it becomes overwhelming. And what I find myself doing is filling the silence in the room in like a meeting or an interaction with my own thoughts and ideas rather than giving other people time to process and, and then respond, um, which is what an introvert would need to do. So that's my shadow side of my extroversion preference, if that makes sense, okay? I would say the shadow side of an introversion preference would be someone who really does tend to um, lock themselves away and avoid any social interaction or avoid speaking up even when it's really important to do so, right? So undermining opportunities for themselves just based on the comfort or the discomfort of doing so. So, um, and you can find shadow sides of every single person, every single domain and construct we just talked about. I'm not gonna go through all of them now, but I think it's important for you to be thoughtful of what are some of the ways that sometimes your personality preferences might work against you? The only other really great example I have is like a perceiver and a judger. So a perceiver, remember, is someone who is a procrastinator, much more adaptable, kind of spontaneous. Um, you know, in, in academics, sometimes it does not work to our benefit to be procrastinators because then we get really stressed out and sometimes are not able to submit our assignments on time. As a judger, sometimes we just need to lighten up. If you get too wrapped up in your schedule, sometimes when opportunities come up or things come up that are going to throw your schedule off for the day, it throws you into a complete tailspin and you become really anxious because you don't have that knowledge and control. And so sometimes we just need to loosen up and be able to be a little more adaptable so that we can respond to situations that come up throughout the day or throughout our lives. Um, so I hope that makes sense. That's an important concept to know. These are a couple of really good websites to explore with a lot more information about your personality type, including career options that you can look into um, and just different things like that. So definitely check those out. So we're going to jump now into how this relates to communication and leadership, which is kind of a fun, some fun stuff here. So let's talk about communication styles. Um, and we taught, we touched on this just a little bit, but extroverts tend to want to process things out loud. Okay, so their focus is to talk it out. Um, and their motto is, let's talk this over. Okay, so uh, the best example I can give is when something happens, um, like there, somebody has a bad day at work, let's say, for example, or a bad day at school, um, an extrovert is going to want to call someone and talk about it or text someone and talk about it um, or grab coffee with a friend and, and just vent about it. That's how an extrovert processes um, the information. An introvert tends to have the focus of wanting to think it through, so really be thoughtful about it. And their motto is, I need to think about this. 
So same situation, if an introvert has a bad day at work or a bad day at school, they're going to want to just kind of uh, get some time to themselves to really kind of process and think about it before they um, start talking about it with somebody. So you can see here, those are two very, very, very different communication styles, right? So an introvert is going to need some time to think um, and really process before making a decision or before taking action on something. An extrovert is going to want to talk and process out loud to make a decision um, or, or, or to move forward on a task. So this is where you just have to be really uh, careful, I think, when you're looking at communicating effectively with other people, particularly in the workplace. Um, is you're going to find that you're going to have conflict with people if you're not sensitive to the other preferences. So um, like my example before about wanting to talk over everyone and not giving people space to think and respond, that caused uh, some that has caused some conflicts for me in the past in the workplace. And it really took me being perceptive and me really being intentional about giving that space and being okay to sit in the silence a little bit and allow other people to kind of process. Now on the flip side, introverts, um, they are quick to become very, very annoyed by people who need to talk. Um, and process out loud. And um, that can be a barrier as well because then typically what will happen is the introvert would shut down, kind of disengage and not want to offer anything um, and just kind of let the other person take over. So an introvert is going to have to be really intentional about speaking up um, and not allowing others to sort of talk over them you know, and making sure that their um, voices are being heard because that's really, really, really important. It's not always comfortable, but it's very important. <clears throat> so hopefully that gives you some um, insight there. Sensing versus intuition for communication. So sensors are very, very focused on specifics um, and they really want just the facts. So their motto is just the facts, please. Intuitors are very much focused on the big picture and their motto is give me the 10,000 foot view, right? Which is just, I want to see everything from a big picture perspective and understand how it all fits together. So um, where this comes into play is especially if you're working on a project with others in um, let's say let's say it's a class project. You've been given a class project and you've been assigned a group of people to work with. You're going to have intuitors in the group and you're going to have sensors in the group. Now the intuitors are going to be really good about brainstorming ideas for the project um, and sensors are going to be really good about figuring out the nuts and bolts of what needs to happen in order to get the project completed. So again, you've got to be careful because the sensors might um, you know, get a little too focused on the details and lose sight of the big picture. And so they really need to rely on the intuitors to um, help them um, understand the bigger picture and the end goal. And the intuitors, on the other hand, are not going to be, their strength is not to, um, to look at the details. In fact, that can be very frustrating. It's not a strength for them. And so they're really going to have to work with the sensors on figuring out what those things are. Now, one thing, you know, intuitors are not, um, they, they're okay with, with helping complete small tasks um, and step-by-step and -step things, but they're just not good at coming up with, those, with what those might be. So a sensor is going to have to be really good about communicating to the intuiter, hey, this is what we're going to need to do in order to get to this end goal, if that makes sense. So that's the difference there. A thinker versus a feeler. So thinker, again, they're focused on the logical implications of their communication, right? So they're gonna be thinking, is this logical? So they're really gonna be kind of in their head when they're communicating um, to people and sometimes it is at the expense of other people's feelings, right? Because they're not thinking about how it's going to um, 
sound to another person or whether or not it may hurt somebody's feelings, they're really just thinking very analytically and very logically. Whereas a feeler is really going to be focused on um, thinking about and processing through how they're going to impact other people and their motto is, will anyone be hurt? So one example of this is, um, let's say there is, we'll go back to the conflict um, situation. So resolving a conflict. Um, sometimes resolving a conflict means that you have to talk things through with people. Um, so a thinker, when they go to talk things through, is going to be extremely, um, very just kind of, these are the facts, very logical, um, and let's get to the bottom of this. Let's figure out what's right and what's wrong here and then move on with our day. No hard feelings. A feeler, on the other hand, is going to want to kind of get you know, everyone settled down, make sure everyone's sort of on the same page, um, make sure no one's walking away feeling super hurt, um, you know, really trying to, again, like I mentioned before, create harmony there. So here's the thing that I think is really important to keep in mind is if you're a thinker and you're interacting with feelers, which is going to happen because there's lots of feelers in the world and lots of thinkers in the world, um, you, there is a complete, you have to keep in mind that there is a completely different approach that a feeler is going to take to the same situation. You also have to keep in mind that sometimes you may come across as very abrasive and cold to a feeler. And it's not that you are, it's just that may be the way that you come across to someone from that who has that personality preference. Um, a feeler, on the other hand, is going to have to keep in mind that there is there is a, some value sometimes to being more objective and logical in resolving conflicts and making decisions and communicating with people. Um, and so really trying to um, sometimes step back and listen to the thinker and be um, open to some of what they're saying and try not to take it so personally um, is really important. So in order to communicate effectively, you really need to be aware of the different perspectives um, and be aware of the different approaches. And then the last one, judger versus perceiver. A judger, again, is going to just uh, be focused on, um, in their communication, like closure. So um, figuring out, okay, what do we need to do? Very task-oriented. Let's get it done. Um, perceiver is going to be focused more on processing. So um, let's wait and see. Let's talk about this. Let's think about this. Let's see what happens. Um, and so one example of communication between these two might be um, if you are, let's go back to the, let's go back to the example of planning a vacation. So if you're a judger and you're planning a vacation with a perceiver, um, the judger is going to want to get all the decisions made, everything wrapped up, um, you know, the, the hotels booked, the plane tickets booked, and the agenda set and have it done and over with. The perceiver is might be more like, you know what, let's just hold off, let's wait, let's see what comes up. Um, we don't need to get in too much of a rush. Let's just get, you know, get to our vacation destination and see what happens when we're there. Just kind of go with the flow. Um, and neither perspective is wrong, but when you're communicating with each other, you might get frustrated with each other because you have two different intentions in that communication. The judger is trying to get stuff done and the perceiver is trying to be open to possibilities, right? So um, there's definitely benefits to both. And I think understanding and finding a middle ground sometimes is important from both perspectives there as well. So as you're communicating as a judger or as you're communicating as a perceiver, really keeping in mind um, that other perspective is important. Okay, so now we're going to jump into leadership, and we're going to talk specifically about how 
the Myers-Briggs type indicator is related to the L4 strategy model of leadership, which is a particular theoretical model associated with leadership. And there has been um, research done on how the MBTI um, types relate specifically to this, this model of leadership. Um, and it's so it, it the the L4 model the reason why it's called that is because there's four um, different cultural patterns of leadership that have been identified in this research. So the first one is the cooperation cultural pattern, and people who are that kind of leader who lean toward that pattern value cooperation, teamwork, sharing, diversity, and collaboration. So it's very much a democratic leadership style. Um, the second one is called an inspiration cultural pattern, which is all about engagement, recognition, career planning, training, and development. So it's inspiring people who report to you or people on your team to always do, do their best and look forward and set goals and um, uh, sort of be inspirational in your work and their work as a leader. The next cultural pattern is achievement, and it's focused specifically on performance, innovation, competition, and excellence. So you can see there um, very sort of um, emphasizes the need to achieve a certain level of performance. Um, so really looking at specific benchmarks and goals, and then holding people accountable to those benchmarks and goals. And then there's a consistent cultural pattern, which is just someone who really relies a lot on order, rules, standardization, and follow through in their leadership style. So it's a very disciplined leadership style, and the expectation for people who report to you is that they will adhere to um, that structure and those order and those rules. So it's very clear cut. Um, so those are the four strategies, and we're going to talk now about how the personality types relate to each of those four. Um, and we're particularly going to look at those two middle letters, because those two middle letters on your personality type are the most important when it comes to um, leadership and is what this research actually focused in on. Um, so, um, let's see here, let's get to the, that what the research shows is that people who have a sensing and feeling middle two letters, so an SF in the middle of their personality type, tend to be more sympathetic and friendly. Um, people with the sensing and thinking letters together, ST, tend to lean more practical and analytical. The NF, the intuition and feeling, tend to be more insightful and enthusiastic. And the NT, the intuition and thinking, tend to be more logical and analytical. Okay, so keep those in mind. And we're going to talk about how those relate now to the cultural patterns. So SF leaders um, tend to favor the cooperation um, cultural pattern. So they tend to encourage people to work together, to help one another, to achieve common goals. So SF leaders are really, really, really focused on collaboration and cooperation. That tends to be their leadership pattern. ST leaders tend to um, lean more toward the consistent leadership style, which um, is that they establish rules and systems to help people achieve consistent results efficiently and effectively. So really a lot of stability, a lot of structure, um, a lot of um, uh, rules and systems in place to make the expectations very, very clear to people. NF leaders um, tend to go lean toward the inspiration cultural pattern, which is that they inspire people to do um, 
due to their strong beliefs in the organization's values of serving social needs and helping people grow and develop. Um, so really just sort of um, always focused on inspiring people to do better, inspiring people to give, you know, 100%, those kinds of things. Um, and then the NT leaders uh, lean toward the achievement cultural pattern, um, which means they tend to like to motivate people to perform at high levels and work toward being the best and achieving excellence. So you see this leadership style a lot um, in sales and marketing um, because those benchmarks and those um, sales quotas and things are super important. And so the focus on achievement is, is always there. Um, but that personality type, that personality contract struct tends to go lean toward, toward that achievement. Um, so I think, um, I think one thing uh, that we'll talk about real quick before I move on to the next slide is, you know, we talked about the shadow self. Well, there's a shadow self in leadership too. So SF leaders who are the cooperation cultural pattern, they have to be careful about um, creating an organization that is managed by committee with no direction and no accountability. Right, so if you rely too much on co cooperation, sometimes there isn't enough structure and there isn't enough uh, clear leadership in order to um, get work done and meet goals. Um, so that's something really important that SF leaders are gonna have to keep in mind. The ST leaders with the consistent cultural pattern um, may create an organization that feels controlling, autocratic, and political, um, which basically means uh, it feels like there isn't a lot of buy-in from people in the organization in the decision making, that it's very top down and uh, you know may not be may not be creating um, a lot of harmony amongst the, the people. So you have to be careful about that. And F leaders with the inspirational cultural pattern may create an organization that feels exclusive or clubby, um, low performing and undisciplined. So more the rah-rah and not enough of the let's get stuff done. Um, so really being aware that there needs to be some balance there is, is key, is important. And then finally, the ST leaders, the consistent cultural pattern, um, they can create a organization that is cold and different and blindly ambitious at times. So um, just, you know, going for achievement for the sake of achievement is not always the best thing. Um, you know, wanting to really um, find some balance in that sometimes it's okay um, to sort of just meet the status quo and get things done that are at, just meeting the expectations at times, depending on what it is. So those are all important things to know. Um, these are one word descriptors or adjectives for each of the personality types that I think are really interesting. So I don't know if they would describe you, but I can tell you for my personality type, which is ENFJ, the teacher, is the perfect descriptor of my leadership style. Um, so it's just really interesting. So find yours there and see if that's something that really um, tends to fit for you. All right, so that essentially concludes my presentation. I have a lot more information and handouts and different things on the MBTI in communication and the MBTI and leadership if you guys are interested. So feel free to reach out. Um, I think now is a really great time for you to start to develop these skills and to explore. Work-based learning is one really great way to do that, you know, with job shadows and internships. Um, also to, you know, like we talked before about the career path, um, you know, making sure you're on a path that is going to feel like it's the right fit for you, that you're gonna thrive in um, in the, the career that, that you end up with um, after, after completing this academic journey that you're on here with us and beyond. So um, take the time to research. 
um, take the time to Google your personality type and see what you can find out. And then certainly feel free to call me or call us to schedule an appointment. If you feel like you need more one-on-one -on -one assistance, that's kind of what we're here for. So um, you, since this is recorded, I can't get, take any questions from you now, but just know that I'm always open to any questions. So please feel free to just reach out to me at any time. Thank you so much for your time and take care.